of this light, it's like a movie set for me. So I'm thinking of doing just a show like that. <laughs> I don't know why it's hilarious to me. Dramatic as um, fuck. Exactly. <laughs> Clem, do you have a do you have a link? We are live. I just tweeted out. Okay, I will just quickly tweet it out from your from my own account, and then we'll get going. Um, we're uh, Mike. I know we're you're used to uh, Bristol. We're actually I don't know okay. if you've heard. We're significantly lower production value here. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Trust me, I'm I'm plenty used to this. Don't worry. Yeah. I work at I work at four o'clock in the morning. Our production value ain't that high either. <laughs> <laughs> you get you get the PA crew. Exactly. I got the trainees. They're training everyone on the overnight boards and sticking them on our show to make their mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get the show started in three. I got three, two, one. All right, there's no reason for you to clap like that. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. It is the post Game of Thrones show. I am your host, Charlie Wesco, the Barstool Sports Game of Thrones uh, blogger, recapper, whatever have you. And I am joined, as usual, with my co-host, the Many Snacks God, the Iron Bank Shot of Bravos, the blogger of the morning, the House of Black and White Cookies, the Porzingis that was promised, the King Size Kit Kat Slayer, ruler of the Seven Courses, Clemwell Charlie, the White Bread Walker, the Swedish Blackfish, the Snackfish, Azora High Cholesterol, the King's Road Commuter, and the Blogger Without Banners, Clem. Clem, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Always good when you drop those fucking ridiculous <laughs> names on me. It makes me laugh every time, man. <laughs> it's like a really white, nerdy version of Jesus and Mero, of what they do on that show with just <laughs> a million nicknames. And then finally, we have a very special guest from ESPN in what is, I'm sure, the highest production value show he's ever been on, uh, talking to two idiot bloggers on a YouTube live stream. Uh, Mike Golick Jr., you've seen him on uh, Mike and Mike. You're going to see him on Golick and Wingo is coming up, and you see him on shows like Sports Nation. Mike, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me. I'm right, I'm right at home in this setting. This is actually right around where I should be. ESPN's <laughs> a little too highbrow for my taste, so we're, uh, we're in good situation. We're in good hands right here. And anybody who's ever listened to your show knows that you try to slip in all the Game of Thrones that you possibly can, uh, but now you can just do it openly. Now you can just talk about it. You don't even have to pretend. I know, man. I'm tired of, have to hi tired of having to hide this shit. I mean, between that and all the stuff I tweet out and uh, try and get in on The Bachelor and Bachelorette on the show, my bosses all freaking hate it. So yeah. this is going to be a nice outlet. Well, if you want to do the reverse, you can just like start randomly talking about Colin Kaepernick or something in the middle of our show. All right. So let's let, your freak, start. let your freak flag fly, Mike. You're am yeah. amongst friends right now. Yeah, you also, okay, safe man, space. Football, man, we can do it. Like, we can, we can do anything. <laughs> Um, let's get right to the show, though, because we are a few minutes late and people have been waiting. Um, let's start off with Daenerys. So it was, I think Daenerys is obviously, it wasn't the most explosive part of the show, but I think ultimately it's going to end up being the most important. The first scene we saw of her was her going at it with Varys. Just a very intense conversation right off the bat. Questioning his loyalties, you kind of got a glimpse into his character and what motivates him. Uh, eventually she decides to spare his life. Nice thing to do to a guy who's basically been acting on your behalf for a couple of months, but whatever. Uh, she decides to spare his life, have him swear to serve her, and also promise his honesty if she he ever thinks that she's basically turning into her father. Uh, then she meets with the Red Priestess, who identifies her as possibly being Azora High. The John Danny alliance that has seemed inevitable for very many seasons, the first step towards it, have been taken. Uh, and you get a kind of look in her war room and all the different factions in it. So there's a lot to dissect, and I'm sure we're going to get into all of it. Clem, what was your first thought from what we saw from Daenerys today? My boy Varys was on the hot seat, man. Hot seat, cool <laughs> throne. Varys was on the hot seat. He was burning his fucking ass off. Um, one thing about Varys is he's definitely always – like he whatever he says about the people, I believe him. He's my dude. He, you know, I chose him over Littlefinger before. I knew how much of a snake Littlefinger was. Dude, the, he always has his hands hidden, you know, when he has it like this. The <laughs> motherfucker crosses his fingers, man. Varys is a snake, but you know it's snake until you make it, like our boy KFC said. Um, I was happy to see that he survived. I think he, he's only going to – he's like this – I don't know, maybe the second most powerful person in that group, I think. So um, I was scared, but in the long run, I was just happy he made it out alive, man. That's all I can really say about my boy Varys. Mike, do you think Varys gets out of Daenerys's inner circle with his life, or do you think that he's gonna try to backstab her? Or something's gonna happen. What What do you think is gonna happen with him? 
Yeah, because he never seems like the kind of really turning around on anyone. Like, he just knows he's going to find his way to wherever it is that keeps him alive. Like he said, I, I think it was uh, uh, Meat Pie or whatever the kid's name was that Arya was talking to later in the episode that drops that I'm a survivor line. Like, that's Varys. That's who he is. So I, yeah. I don't ever worry about him. I just know he's going to be the one left standing. And I think for that reason, though, the, that he is such a survivor and he's been able to make it through what he's been able to make, too. Danny possibly alienating him is so stupid because if there's one thing she doesn't have, one weakness, which is why she needs Tyrion, is that she has no idea what's going on in Westeros. She's never been there in her entire life. This is her, this is her first time being there. The fact that she would take the one person who was like her proverbial eyes and ears and possibly alienate that person is ridiculous. And the fact that she's also questioning somebody for turning on people who he swore vows to is also absurd because anybody who she's relies to or she's going to have to rely on as someone who's done the exact same thing at some point. And she doesn't know that it's a huge night for guys with no dicks on this show. So <laughs> Huge night. I was literally about to bring that up next. Uh, Wait, let me just say something here. Hot pie? My parents. I don't know about you. Mike, do you you don't live at home. You have a job and like a big life and stuff. Are you are you at your parents' house or whatever right now? Or did you watch that by yourself? No, no. I watched this one by myself and for good reason. I had no idea I was gonna do the, see the dickless dude absolutely going to work tonight. I I hype like, for my boy. Hype. My parents are cool. Uh I've seen watch mo- a lot of movies with them, a lot of sex scenes with them, and like it's obviously always uncomfortable, but like you sort of get through it. That was like a whole other level of uncomfortable. That that was like a straight up that that was like the weirdest porn ever made. That, I, that's what we just watched. We just watched the porn, even by like Game of Thrones standards. Gray, so speaking about hot seats, a lot of boyfriends are on the hot seat right now because Gray Worm's like the best boyfriend you can ever have. He just goes down on you and then calls it a day. Like he doesn't have a dick to even like fuck up his brain. He'll protect you. He has a job. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's powerful. Like, there's a lot to like about dating Grey Worm, actually. I was thinking that. I was thinking about how uh, Missandei, like, while during that whole scene and she was professing his love for him, I'm like, there's one really huge thing that you seem to be overlooking. Like, good for you. Like, maybe that's true love. You're able to overlook certain things. Seems like a big one. But I guess she, I, but I, then I thought, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, this could actually easily be spun into a positive. Here's a question for you, Mike. You're kind of an adult. Clem, you're definitely an adult. Does that <laughs> awkwardness of watching sex scenes with your parents, does that like ever go away? Like Clem, you have a kid. Is it, is it not awkward anymore? Or is it still awful? It's a billion percent still awkward. Uh, I watch private parts to Howard Stern movie with my parents. The dumbest thing in the theater. Like I willfully <laughs> did that like a fucking asshole. Where you and can't like, I didn't know the, yeah, where you can't leave and you're basically, and it's like a tit on like a 5 billion foot screen. Um, and now that I have a daughter, so now I have my parents that I'm scared to watch these things with and my daughter who always wakes up like five minutes before throne starts and I'm in a fucking, I'm in the freaking mode every single time I'm with either of them. So yeah, it doesn't get easier. It only gets worse. That's no, yeah. As someone who two Christmases ago saw Wolf of Wall Street with my entire family and my grandmother, I sat <laughs> two seats from my grandma and watched Leo do coke out of a hooker's butt in the opening scene and realized this was going to be the worst Christmas of all time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quiet car ride home. Uh, what do you guys think about uh, the possible translation of Azora High being Danny? Do you think that it could be? Do you think it'd be Jon Snow still? Do you think it'd be Danny? Probably maybe some combination of both what do you think about her possibly being the prince that's promised clem i think melisandre will say whatever it's like when you go to a psychic they could always fucking be like i see this i see that it's in the cards it's all a bunch of bullshit she'll say whatever she has to do to survive just like varus will and it's just another melisandre you know a bunch of bullshit i don't like i don't know if we'll ever actually see that come to fruition and when if we do see azor high or whatever it may be she'll be oh yeah this is exactly what i meant because that's just the kind of bullshit they play on people all right, nice atheist take from Clem. Mike, what do you think about it? Uh, you know what? If I'm going to believe anyone's going to fit the Azora high mold, I, I feel like it's got to be Danny when you look at all the stuff. And I picked, just for some dumb reason, knowing I was coming on with you guys, the perfect day to go back and brush up on all this shit and looking at all that stuff, whether it's being, you know, born in the, you know, the bleeding star and all that stuff and uh, the smoke and salt, it matches up so perfectly with Danny that she seemed like the only real one anyway. Like Jon Snow, we were trying to force that square peg into a round hole with this. It feels like if it's going to be anyone, it's going to be her. Yeah, I wonder if it could be a combination of both too, just because, and I guess you would have to include Tyrion if you go by the definition I'm going on. But if you were to look at their backstories, they're kind of more or less, well, first of all, they're both half Targaryen, uh, or she's fully Targaryen, he's half Targaryen. But the fact that, you know, they both were mothers died, you know, 
in child, I believe Danny's was in childbirth, but at a very young age, regardless, you know, they both were born in really kind of low circumstances, marginalized their entire lives and sort of rose up through their own powers. And, you know, unlikely, a lot of people didn't really see it coming. There's definitely similarities between the three. So I wonder if they all could be the prince that was promised. But again, this could just be a bunch of, you know, really religious nonsense that absolutely means absolutely nothing for the lady in red. But speaking of Jon Snow, I was at a transition. So he goes back and it's sort of like when you get in a fight uh, with like you get in a fight with somebody and then you sort of like work it out and then you're like, all right, we're going to have the solution. Then the exact situation arises again. And then you find out we've learned absolutely nothing. We have done zero of the things we were going to promise. Again, he is listening to Sansa. He's taking Sansa's advice absolutely not into account whatsoever. Uh, and Sansa hasn't learned to not question him in front of everybody. They go back bickering about whether he should go to Dragonstone or not. Do you guys think that it's a mistake that jo uh, that Jon Snow is going to head to Dragonstone, Mike? Uh, I don't think it's a mistake. I, I think he kind of understands the parties involved it, well enough to gauge the situation. But my God, are they ever going to talk any of this out before they go in front of people? Like, you just left and named her queen. So clearly you give a shit enough, but not enough to just talk this out before. They're the two worst teammates of all time. Like, okay. I couldn't imagine a teammate of mine scumming me out in front of a coach over something low stakes. They're trying to not get wiped out by the fucking Night King. Like... I, I don't understand this at all. They're terrible teammates. Yeah, their team dynamic is awful. What do you think, Clem? Do you think that – I mean, obviously, we know John's not walking into a trap because we have the, you know, omni, you know, omniscient narrator point of view of it. But mm -hmm. do you still think that what he did to openly defy kind of all the Northern Lords was a political mistake? He, he still hasn't learned from all his mistakes at the Night's Watch, I feel yeah. like. All like, like the people being upset with him and, you know, he's making dangerous, he's making allies into dangerous enemies. He's just going through the same shit all over again, which is like, I thought he learned through that when they stabbed him a billion fucking times in the chest, but he still hasn't learned it. It's frustrating. Then seeing Littlefinger smirk, it's like now you have the fucking wolf in the hen house and you're just scared and the thing is melisandre's here like tr like saying why Jon snow is a good ally for daenerys and all this stuff like the motherfucker came back to life drop that on daenerys and she might look at Jon snow in a different light like what are you doing you're burying the lead yeah, yeah. oh by the way he's westerosi jesus <laughs> <laughs> it's like just a thing you it's sort of like the virgin birth not like being mentioned in the new testament explicitly it's like that would be a thing you'd probably mention like it would be a, it'd be something that would come up um but so there's that sort so there's sort of difference peter baelish obviously sees an opportunity to arise you see that that that's sm the baelish smirk is i i don't i forget the actor's name what what, what was he on the other show clem he was uh carcetti mayor carcetti in uh the wire Oh yeah, that's the same guy. Oh wow, I didn't even realize that. I didn't that's the same guy. Head. Yeah, dude, that's crazy. That's like when someone pointed out that the Archmaester is a uh, Horace Slughorn from um, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince. I was like, I knew I recognized him from somewhere, but Whoa. I didn't see where it was. I just blew Mike's mind. Um, but anyway, he so you saw that he went and one more, wait, one, one more thing here: the baby dinosaur from Dinosaurs is also the voice of Elmo. That blows everyone's fucking mind. Sorry, I just had to add that one in there. Oh my God! Wow, this is we should guys, we should just do a just pop clem culture. bombs all <laughs> over the place in here. Jesus <laughs> we're 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 just teaching the youth of America, not just about Game of Thrones. But anyway, so Bela, she has that typical glint in his eye where he sees, and Sansa is his access point to power. Obviously, he does sort of have you know he has her ear, whether she wants to admit it or not. She definitely has at least some level of influence with her, even if she is ultimately going to be the one to kill him, as I believe that he will be. But then he tries to go and talk to Jon Snow in a really private, uh, tender moment where he's obviously looking at Ned, Ned Stark's remains. And what I thought was interesting was that it was setting up to just be a typical Game of Thrones, you know, like kind of scheming, long-winded, them trying to feel each other out. You think of Varys and Elena Tyrell in the gardens that type of episode, that type of scene. But then Jon Snow, just instead of like, you know, playing chess, he just flips the, you know, he flips the board <laughs> over and just puts his hand around his throat. I was almost thinking about, in a weird way, do you think Jon Snow could be impervious to the political machinations of Baelish? Because he's so oblivious to politics and so apolitical, you almost can't manipulate. Like he's almost too honest to be manipulated. It's almost to me like Trump being the person who could beat Hillary Clinton because like the Clinton machine is so unbelievable at politics. So Trump's like, I'm not even going to let you beat me at this game. So I'm just like, not even going to play it. Like I'm going to play an entirely new game to me. That's sort of like Peter Baelish and Jon Snow. Uh, what do you think, Clem? Do you think Baelish and Snow, they're going to, one's going to be the downfall of the other. 
Yeah, this is fucking Jon Snow is pissing me so off. I'm just trying to like keep my composure right now and not look like a fucking Dude, get angry. It's fine. That's good TV. Like this is Ned Stark all over again. You don't fucking choke out Littlefinger because all you're gonna do is piss him off. He knows he has your goat now. He knows how you feel about your sister. Like hold your cards close to your chest, and like you like you you know you're referencing you know Trump versus Hillary. I'm thinking like the last guy who was like Jon Snow in terms of this kind of I don't play politics was Ned Stark, and he doesn't have a fucking head anymore. His bones are buried in that goddamn crypt or whatever it is. And Rob so. Stark. Uh, yeah, exactly. Rob so Stark made more or less the same mistake by trusting Walter Frey. He's not learning from all these dead people's mistakes, including his own dead ass, which was dead for a, f- for a fucking few days. So Yeah, yeah you don't um, even need, like, another example. You could just be like, no, that time you die. Like, <laughs> that, like that happened, like, a month ago? Like, you could, like should, that should have maybe taught you something. Mike, what do you think about the whole exchange between Jon Snow and Baelish? I'm glad we brought we established the connection already with that one uh, the other guy who had been in Harry Potter because the parallels between Harry Potter and Jon Snow are startling. They are both so dumb and substandard at what they do and are buoyed by the people around them in such a way where they keep surviving these things. They both end up dying and coming back. It just it gets so frustrating to watch them continue to succeed in spite of how dumb the things that they do are because Littlefinger knew exactly what to do. Like, oh, I thought your mom was hot. Oh, she didn't like you very much. Now I'm into your sister. Like, older brother mode got activated, and I can respect that. But at some <laughs> point, if you're going to be king, you got to act like it a little bit. That's uh, that's uh, that's a big warning for me when I was just trying to invite myself to your brother's wedding by being your sister's date for these past few months. Right now, I'm kind of nervous being on this podcast right now. But uh, we're going. Probably shouldn't have brought that up. Uh, but then we're going and <laughs> trying to figure out. Uh, um, Baelish, I agree with that. He hasn't learned from the mistake. But here's the thing: it's such an obvious thing to write about, and I feel like I bring it up in every recap. I'm like, Jon Snow isn't bringing up, uh, isn't learning from the mistakes of that, like that he's making. He's so stupid in politics. Not only is it not brought up like by everybody who watches the show, it's brought up by the people in the show that Sansa like explicitly told him was like, Hey, you are making huge tactical errors, whether it was like Rickon or like, like that was, that's obviously kind of the epitome example. And he's still not listening. Like I, at what point does he learn? Cause I feel like he has the plot armor where he can't die. I feel like him, Daenerys, and Tyrion are the only three people who are legitimately safe no matter what. But at what, I don't know at what point he learns. Probably like the season series finale when he gets a fucking dagger through his chest by Littlefinger. And like, like Mike said, every single time, it's like him and Sansa just don't talk this out beforehand. It's like just being like, all right, we're not going to work on plays in football. We're just going to audible it and just fly. It's like that works in Madden when you just run hat routes the whole game. That doesn't work in real fucking life, man. Well, it's, yeah. he's like the kid in college. He's the serial procrastinator, and everything just keeps working out for him, and he just throws it together last minute, and, you know, it's uh, someone dies, so he decides to charge everyone and go in there and not die somehow. Like, it's just – it's what this guy does, and he keeps getting rewarded for it. He's like the Lane Kiffin of Westeros. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the two like things that, that I like brought that. up in the live chat, which we are going to interact with so people keep talking in it, is Ian says, John is the only one who genuinely understands White Walkers, the most serious threat. Just true. But Jillian asks, do you have any idea what Littlefinger is up to? He smiled after John threatened him. Yeah, I think a Littlefinger was got more or less what he wanted. I think he was just trying to knock John off balance. Like, I don't think he has any use for him at the moment other than to start. It's almost like it's like a boxer right now. He's just like sending a punch just to see, like in the first round, just to see how he'd react to it. I think he was there just to kind of, you know, just to sort of needle John a little bit, or do you think that there was a larger game at play if you guys were to try to get inside the brilliant mind of Littlefinger? Littlefinger is just fun. looking for how he's going to beat you. It's like in my, uh, Mike Tyson's punch out. You just need to figure it out, like the guy's weakness, and then you're good. And Littlefinger now knows, like, Sansa going back to Cat, the whole nine, and he's almost like he's so incorruptible. He's, like, almost easy just to knock out, though, in that sense. And he's like King he's Hippo. Good, uh, <laughs> he's right. He was right when he said, I saved your life. And Sansa's right when he says, we still need the Knights of the Vale. Because the Knights of the Vale, if you guys remember, has never fully been conquered. It's the only place in Westeros that hasn't. I think Aegon, they might have surrendered to Aegon during the uh, during his invasion. But other than that, it's actually never been had. So he's... Yeah. And it's, it's sort of wild, too, that we're minutes removed from Jon Snow up there saying we need powerful allies in that room full of all the lords of the north. And then he goes downstairs, and he's got a guy there who's an ally of his and just starts choking him out. 
Exactly. Somebody just said so many analogies. I guess analogies are we said Chekhov's gun every other sentence in the last show. I just getting making cross making cross pop culture references. That's the new uh, that's the new <laughs> Chekhov's gun. Uh, last thing on Jon Snow is somebody asks, do you think he ends up bending the knee to Cersei? I think if he bends the knee to Cersei, he might get killed. The nor the, the North might turn on him. That would be the thing. So my inclination is no. But I feel like Cersei is on a power trip to a level where right now she might demand it of him. So whether or not he's willing to bend the knee, I think that's I think that's a really interesting question that I could see going either way. I mean, Lady Mormont openly disagreed with him, which is not something I thought we would ever see. Do you think John bends the knee when Daenerys demands it of him? Because the alliance seems so inevitable, you feel like something has to mess it up. Yeah, I, I, you said Cersei. I don't think he bends it to Cersei. Oh, I'm sorry. I think, I'm sorry. I meant Daenerys. I meant yeah, Daenerys. Sorry. I, I, I would say yes because John has – I don't know if John has a fucking brain anymore, actually. <laughs> Let me think about this. The only reason I'm going to say no is because the whole thing was – actually, no. It, didn't the Starks bend the knee back in the day? Yeah. Just, so he will do – he's following fucking the Stark playbook fucking play-by-play. Play. So if they did it, he'll do it. So he will, yes, bend the knee to Daenerys. That's my guess. I'm trying to think of what the smart thing to do would be and then just guess that John's got to be the exact opposite. So, like, right now, I'm not figuring out, like, what do I know on the show and things are going to happen? I'm like, all right, what would be the correct move so I know exactly what he won't do? Mike, do you think he'll end up bending the knee? I, I, like, I want it. Like, weirdly, and this must just be the dumb charm of Jon Snow, I want to believe that when it comes to, like, a pivotal moment like that, he'll do the right thing. But more of this is me having faith in Tyrion as the hand of the queen, knowing that he understands the value of Jon Snow. And this could be one of those stubborn moments where Jon Snow knows he can't bend the knee. And so Tyrion then has to go on his, you know, persuasion convincing tour that, all right, this is a guy we need around. This is a powerful ally. And he's going to throw all that White Walker talk on top of her too and kind of put her on game there because he's obsessed. If she, if she believes him. Yes. That yeah. saying. It's the biggest. It's really significant. I think another thing about the potential of the Northern Lords turning on him he is still the only one who saw the White Walkers. So he is the only one who fully understands how serious the threat is, which does lead to some sort of disconnect of information and incentives between him and the people who, you know, he's lording over right now. So he has to, you know, he has to watch out for that. All right, moving on, we have about, because we have four more things to get to. Cersei. She has to convince basically the equivalent of, um, she is the equivalent right now if someone has to convince someone to join the New York Knicks to beat being like, hey, you have to join us to beat the Golden State Warriors. Like, this is your best chance. Uh, I realize that I'm a queen who has absolutely no political power anymore because everybody in the city uh, I'm in, I have murdered. And I have pissed off all the other lords. I have very, just my own army. I don't rule over most of the Seven Kingdoms. By the way, there's a foreigner with a mercenary company of eunuchs, a bunch of savages, a Mongol savages, and three dragons. You have to take our side. Uh, Jamie tries to make a couple promises to Samuel Tarley's father. It didn't seem like he received it. He could change his mind. He seemed, when he said Warden of the South, there wasn't a definitive conclusion of that, but it wasn't going well. Uh, and then he goes in Quiburn, who's kind of her ace in the hole now because he's the guy who thinks outside the box and he's willing to fight dirty and do whatever it takes. Shows him that they're basically having a medieval, like, I don't, I don't know medieval weaponry long enough to know. A, a spear thing, that a harpoon, a dragon harpoon to use to take out dragons as to per, uh, serve as a possible defense. I think Cersei's in more trouble than she even realizes. Clem, do you see any way out of this for her? You know what? I gave Kyburn his chance. The dude did some weird shit. He turned the, zo- the mountain into a fucking zombie. He's definitely a different dude. When he came out with that weapon... I was like, I'm out. I'm officially done on Kyburn. Uh, I only give Cersei credit. She is so fucking crazy. She's not afraid to go like three steps, like like shit that's the, the most, like she's dark web. Cersei's yeah. the dark web. Another <laughs> analogy for our people there. And I do not fuck with the dark web. I do not fuck with Cersei Lannister. So I think that she will like basically go down swinging, burning everything down as she goes, kind of like, again, like you said, the James Dolan Knicks, it's all going to f- crumble down in a beautiful, disgusting masterpiece. But uh i'm out man selling on lannisters mike what do you think of lannisters you yeah think- i would probably be selling but stock's low so you can buy it low if we were to use an awful bill simmons-esque analogy 
that that is true but i'm kind of with uh with you guys as far as the medieval weaponry just because we saw this play out to continue our theme of references the desolation of smog in the hobbit series you saw how hard it was to kill one dragon with a city full of harpoon guns killing three with that thing down there seems a bit unlikely for me but uh cersei continues to be the baddest woman in black in a season where everyone decided to go all black everything all at once (laughs) Yes. So she's she's doing the damn thing there. But I, I heard you guys last week too. Um, the prediction that Jamie kills Cersei. Yep. I'm going the other way. I think Cersei's going to kill Jamie in this season. I think I, maybe not this season, but at some point that seems where this is going because she seems got she's already killed the rest of her family. I don't know if Jamie would ultimately have the stomach to do it because he's been revealed as more and more of too good of a guy in all this. I think she gets him before he goes the other way. Do you think she kills him in response to an, like the real possibility he kills her, though? Uh, yeah, I think just the, the, the growing distrust, something's going to happen along the way because Jamie has kind of shown that he's got an eye for the greater good in all this that Cersei just can't entertain anymore. So somewhere along the line, he's going to do something that might compromise them, and she's just not going to have it. Yeah, it's also just a tough sell in general, the fact that it, here's the one reason I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. She's in a terrible spot. The last time she was in a terrible spot, she blew up the entire noble class of King's Landing. So, like, that's just what I, that's just what I wonder if what possible just incredibly evil out there ace in the hole that she has to play. But I, I just don't see one right now. Like, like there was the obvious there's going to be a gathering. Like, in sort of in a war, that's Cersei's thing. Cersei hits you when you don't even know that you're fighting. When you're in the middle of a war, though, like an openly declared hostile war, there's almost nothing duplicitous she can do to kill you because you're already actively trying to kill each other. So, I don't know. We'll see where that goes, but it's going to be – she's definitely in even a worse spot than people think. Samuel Tarly at the Citadel. I guess we have to throw up every Sam scene. I guess that's going to be the rule. We had him cleaning out the chamber pots. Now they had him cleaning out the grayscale wound, which was disgusting. Um, so I guess he's going to save Jorah Mormont's life. I mean, they're, they wouldn't really do it in the show unless it was going to work. Um, hopefully Sam doesn't get grayscale. Probably won't, might. Um, but what I find more interesting about the Sam scene is his interaction with the Archmaester is that it's very hard for him to convince them that he knows something they don't, that there's something outside of their realm of experience that he has that can be of possible value to them the fact he's been beyond the wall, the fact he served in the Night's Watch. And for people who are extremely academic and learn only by books, sometimes it is very hard for them to accept both in Game of Thrones and in real life that there are things outside of that that are of value. And when he's trying to convince them to form a defense against the White Walkers, that's going to be a huge problem. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with Jorah now that he's, you know, gonna, he's going to be an active player again. He's going to be off the DL pretty soon, it looks like. I don't know, Clem. What do you think? Uh, go anything. Sam, Archmeister, Jorah. Did you have a strong take on any of it? Clem? Did you say me? Yeah, sorry. I might have oh, said that. Um, I love yeah, the, I, the fucking scene was gross. It's like when I watch MTV The Challenge and they just start puking, I just can't watch shit like that on TV. So I was just looking the other way. I couldn't watch a, a second of that nonsense. Um, I think the big thing that's going to be taken away is – I've heard there's been a lot of uh, chatter about this. We even got a, I saw a tweet, a couple of tweets about it. Um, I think dragon's glass is basically the thing that's going to cure that. Shireen had the issue with, and yeah. stopped and they lived on a fucking mountain of it. So it all makes sense. Yeah. So he addressed it in some way. Yeah. Dragon's glass is apparently the cure all of Westeros. So I think somehow this Jorah thing will bear out that they figure out the dragon's glass. Sam's like the king of dragon's glass, whole nine. Boom. There you go. You know, dragon glass also isn't like a fictional substance. It's just like obsidian, too. Like yeah, it's just meant obsidian. to be. <laughs> Which is another thing I think it's lost. Where I was like, dragon glass and its magical properties, and like it's obsidian. Um, Mike, what, uh, did you have anything uh, that? Did you have any thoughts on the whole Citadel scenes? Uh, no, I think you're, there's like interesting parallels. Obviously, Sam and Jon Snow are tied in a lot of ways, but the fact that no one just wants to buy into how serious is. Uh, like the whole threat of the white walkers is like it's very al gore global warming y like we obviously there's like a really strong metaphorical parallel there but it, between <laughs> that and then the grossest scene cut maybe in the history of this show going from him going into that pus filled scab into aria eating that shepherd's pie in the next scene that was the moment where my stomach finally turned over i i could not do that anymore was that more gross than the than the poop scene i think it probably was 
Oh, yeah. Pus is way grosser than poop. <laughs> not, not a sentence I thought would be uttered when I invited you onto the show, Mike, but thank you for that insight. That is probably true. Pus is grosser than poop. Um, you're right. Also, Sam's willingness to break all the rules. He's going to get kicked out eventually. I mean, so, like he is going, he's going to eventually get caught because there was no re- – everybody keeps uh, – one of the main questions I got, but I didn't answer because I don't know the answer – uh, for the Game of Thrones mail blogs, is people are like, how come there's just no repercussions to him breaking inside the restricted area? I'm like, not yet. But he's he's going to do something against the rules, event, and it'll eventually become a very serious problem for him. Arya. We see Hot Pie. Hot Pie comes back. That actor's a little older. He has not lost weight. Um, <laughs> but good for him, I guess. Here's my concern with Arya, and I hope you guys don't react badly to this or take this personally. I'm a little worried. The fact that we would get Hot Pie, we got Ed Sheeran, we had her killing Walder Frey, we had a dire wolf with her. Is Arya just going to kind of be like a fan service vehicle where, because she doesn't really have any relevance to the plot right now, whenever it's slow, they're going to just kind of throw her in there and be like, all right, we're going to have something, we're going to have like a callback to an earlier thing from earlier episodes that people love and it'll get them excited. It'll give a little bit of pace to the show. May, she's headed up north now, obviously, so she might be involved in the thick of things right now. But Arya hasn't had like relevance to the larger plot in any real way in like four seasons. So I'm just kind of a little bit worried that she's not going to get the role she deserves and instead just get one where she's, yeah, like a glorified vehicle for fan service. Uh, Mike, what do you think about the direction Arya is taking as a plot line as a, plot line as a whole? I would have agreed with you until we saw her turn north. Like, I think that's going to be her her gateway and her ticket back into relevance in the show. Because I'm with you. Like, the Faceless Men storyline almost turned me off to her completely as a character. And thankfully, that got put to its rightful end. But, uh, no, I think she's going to be back in the game. She's, she's too good a, of a character in this show to be completely left out of everything. I feel like it's time for the Starks to all kind of round up. Maybe she even helps um, uh, Sansa and Jon be better teammates. Who knows? Yeah, because she was closer to – Needle was given to her. The, her treasure short was given to her by John. Sansa and John weren't close as kids. I think that's the thing. It's definitely mentioned in the books. Uh, I think it's mentioned in the show in the first season. But it is uh, – there's no doubt that Arya and John are close. And obviously Arya and Sansa had a relationship being two sisters. So, um, And anybody who's had two sisters knows what that relationship is like. So – um, you can definitely, you can, yeah, I think that that could definitely be a good thing. She could be like an intermediary between the two of them. Clem, what do you think? Yeah, I think this, this last episode was more about kind of Aria. Like I, I think I said it actually last week on the, on the podcast here. I think Aria has lost her way. I think she's not who she used to be. And I think she's badass as fuck. Don't get me wrong. But like, I think Nightmare looked at her and was like, I don't know who this kid is. I mean, she was always like a badass, but she wasn't like this faceless <laughs> murdering monster, which again, we love because she's on our side, so to say. Um, but I think this is kind of like more of the, like the loss of Arya's soul, basically. It's completely gone and she's going to be able to get her revenge. But at the end of the day, everything that was important to her will be gone i'm sure the minute she gets back to winterfell if she gets there like sansa will be murdered by little finger because that's just how her luck goes man she just is like the she's the mush she's the yeah. mush she has a mush like kfc and it just follows her around um the nymeria shit was awesome to see the return i think it was nymeria i think again it didn't she didn't realize recognize aria because aria is like a different person than when she left and hot pie saying i'm gonna write that down for my recap log Yep, and Hot Pie saying he's a survivor, put it now. Head on a spike, no more than two episodes, that motherfucker is dead. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I hope not, honestly. Um, but so then there's, no, I think that's true, but here, uh, Jabroni Jones says, I think they're trying to reel her back in from being a psychopath back to a less murdery person. Uh, Arya, Joseph says, Arya is going to play a huge part. Don't be dumb. Sorry, Joseph, I'll try not to be dumb. Here's the thing just about her going to Winterfell, though how do they use her skills? Because that, that's just an interesting thing to me because you can't, I, you can't assassinate a White Walker. Like being a faceless man, I don't think helps assassinate a White Walker. So just how, what use they would put to her, that's unclear. I mean, maybe it'll reveal itself sooner rather than later. Um, but I did think, I just think it is interesting. Will she reunite with the Hound? Because that's what everybody seems to be predicting. 
Yeah, and like the way she was even eating that bread and drinking, she like was he couldn't talk sense into her. Like he was just talking yeah. to her. She couldn't care. Like she hadn't seen this guy in years. They obviously had a friendship and she couldn't care less. It's like when you turn to your buddy and you just tell your buddy is long gone. Like he's gonna get into a fight there, he's gonna do some fucked up shit. Like she had that look of someone who's just ready to fight and doesn't really have like emotions in her brain anymore. Yeah, so it can be a return to her. Maybe maybe Nymeria comes back a second time and she recognizes her because she's more like Arya. Mike, do you think that she's gonna run into the hound? Uh, I think she will. Uh, I think it, it's going to be really interesting if we get that before we see any sort of like potential Clegane Bowl showdown that we all keep holding out hope for. I think, I, feel I, like, I think that will never happen. I feel like the faceless men thing could come into play, though. I mean, she still clearly wants a shot at the queen. And at some point when John and Danny join up together, that's still going to be public enemy number one on the non-White Walker side. So that could be a way to kind of serve both everyone's needs on that with her skill set. Yeah, but then there's also definitely the element. There was no way she was going to kill Cersei, and I wrote this in the blog, but you do, you knew that she wasn't going to kill Cersei because it doesn't make sense that if she goes to kill Cersei and she gets to King's Landing, one of them's dying. It wouldn't make sense to have Arya spend all this time preparing to be an assassin, have one successful assassination of the phrase, and then fail the second one. And also, Cersei is going to she's going to go down in a more epic fashion than just being killed by Arya. Like it's going to be so, it's going to be some device of her own making how she dies not just like a revenge mission so you knew it wasn't going to happen that way but um climb i i like your take it enough that i'm actually going to steal it for the recap log because i did not know what that nymeria scene meant and now i do because you just told me so thank you for that i feel i feel like i'm cheating but the benefits of a siena college business education right there charlie yeah exactly <laughs> you just see things i was a journalism major that's super useful um i i picked I picked my major based on what would get me uh, access to uh, software that I could edit KFC radio with, which is how smart people pick what their college major is going to be. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, last thing we'll talk about the scene that's going to stick the most in people's minds. I wrote down in my notes with that scene with the Suzanne snakes going, mama, mama, mama. I wrote down a joke that I was gonna, I'm gonna, I was gonna put in the blog where I was like, "They are so awful." I'm the last person to criticize Game of Thrones. Like, I fully admit that. If you want like a recap blog that's gonna like really go after the show and be like, "They could have improved this. They could have done this better." I'm the last guy to do that because I just love the show so much. I choose to focus on what they do well rather than what they don't. Their sand snakes are awful. They're just terrible. Every time they go on screen, it's terrible. They're so annoying. They had nothing. So I wrote down, I am rooting for Euron to eventually murder these two. We got it. It was great. Theon, Tiger doesn't change its stripes, man. The, the dickless stays dickless. Theon is still an absolutely yellow-bellied coward, leaving his sister to be killed or worse. And then finally, I think that Alaria being Alaria Sand, Alaria, Alaria being the gift, uh, I thought, you know, we were speculating on what the gift he gives to uh, Cersei is going to be. We People were thinking the dragon horn from the books. People were wondering if it was going to be Tyrion. It's going to be the woman who killed her, killed her daughter. I think that's going to be it. So what uh, Cersei is going to do to that woman is going to be, it's going to make what she did to that nun look like, like, like a tickle fight. Like that's... Yep. Tickle fight was such a corny thing to say. Mike, what did you think of that uh, <laughs> battle? Well, yeah, because I thought the same. Initially, when they go in and they take her out from below deck and she's like, just kill us now, get it over with, and they give you that nod, you think, all right, like, you know, the Greyjoys, rapers and pillagers, like, this is going to go one way. And then you remember Cersei's behind this and you realize it's going to be a thousand times worse than what a bunch of raping, pillaging monsters uh, <laughs> would, do, would do to them. But between that... I wasn't sure where I stood on Euron Greyjoy yet. Once I saw what that dude was doing with an axe, I'm sort of for this guy being a major player in all this. Like, he's a pretty sick bastard, but, man, I just – I'm all for guys with axes. Usually they're underserved in a lot of uh, ways as a fighting tool, but these guys knew what they were doing. It was uh, – that was a fight scene to behold. That was one we needed in the uh, first couple episodes that had been relatively docile outside of the cold open. You know, I learned a lot about, like, college media theory, Mike, about, like, in mainstream media, some voices being underrepresented and being a voice for the voiceless. And I'm glad that you're at ESPN serving the Battle Axe Battalion of, <laughs> of the world, that that segment of the population, you're there to represent them. Well, yeah, you had to show that you can't go into a, you know, an axe fight with a whip and expect to come out alive. I mean, what kind of idiot fights with a whip on a boat and thinks that they're going to live? 
yeah, that's a that's not that's that's a Dorn weapon, not a, not anything else. Clown, what do you think? First off, Mike, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but is there an axe on your body somewhere? Is there is there any tattoo of an axe? If not, I think we need to get one by the end of the season. We don't we don't have one yet, but now that's on the dock, and I've been looking for some new ink, so I feel I I got plenty of real estate. We can get a nice battle axe in here. <laughs> Might I suggest maybe beautiful. like a Mike Tyson tattoo, and in the bottom curve of the axe is like your eye, and then you sort of like have it go around, kind of something like that. That'd be a hell of a way to cement my legacy. I've already gone on air with a full sleeve tattoo. Now doing one with a face tattoo. Really either it's boom or bust. I'm either going to be all in and ESPN's going to love it or I'll be fired tomorrow and be pimping you guys out to see if I can get in a bar stool. Are you the first guy at ESPN actually to go on with full tattoos? Uh, it was, so me and this dude, Jason Fitz, who like used to be the fiddle player in the band Perry works for us now, both did a college football show last fall. We're on separate occasions. We rock full sleeves. Okay. That's that's actually that's quite a feather in the cap. By the way, Brandon Clare, it was Nymeria. She was saying she accepted her choice to go wild. Arya's the wild one of her family, too. All right, so that's a good thing. Theon. Uh, jo- oh, sorry. No, going back to the thing, the Sand Snakes, I'm right with you, Charlie. Um, how we could be introduced to Oberyn Martell and told this is Dorne and be like, this guy is fucking awesome and he fucks up his moves and he's a badass to then getting the sand snakes who absolutely sucked. I might actually just read this, the Dorn part of the books to like not hate Dorn as much as I do right now. Yeah. That's um, true. Well, yeah, I can't believe they're like, has done like, there's a, I, I was, I, my mom was so mad at me. Cause she was just like, no, like, like, it, it's just like, and like if a man, did, she wasn't saying that, but like the subject, she was like, they're cool killers. How do you think that they're so lame? I'm like, cause everything they do is so forced. Like the thing that made Oberyn so cool is it just seemed so easy to him. Like he was just so like naturally that like badass dude who has like sex with everybody and kills everybody and says cool stuff where it's like, it seems like they just like wanted to be that so badly, but they forced it so much. It was just so awful. Let's talk about Theon. We talked about Theon last episode, Clem, Mike. I know you mentioned that you watched the episode. And we said how, you know, you started to feel kind of sympathetic towards Theon uh, because you're like, how much can this guy possibly have gone through? And then I was watching just old episodes because I don't have much, you know, of a social life. And as I was watching old episodes, I saw the one of him like swearing his allegiance to Rob Stark. And as he was doing that, I was like, you know what? No, what? Theon, he deserves to die a thousand deaths. I do have a social life. That was just a joke, guys. You didn't have to. I thought you were going to laugh at that. Uh, the fact that he betrayed her <laughs> again, I, I'm just like, he, he deserves everything he's got. He's just as bad as we think. Do you th- like what? Like what? What happens to Theon now? Like Mike, what do you think? Like happens to Theon now? He's he's turned his back on everyone who he's ever done anything for. Yeah, I, I for a second I thought that he was gonna like just flip it and like tell him to do it and then join up with Euron. Like I thought he was gonna go wow. the ultimate script flipped and just go back with his uncle. But it, now I'm not sure. I mean, who's gonna take this guy in at this point? Who can look at him and honestly like? did he maybe leave it in a decent enough place with Sansa and the Starks to come out of this with them and like scurry back to the north? I don't know who the hell's gonna take this guy at this point. Well, uh, Joseph. Just said, uh, Joseph's just in the set, Theon will redeem himself, I guarantee it. He's had, like, five chances. Like, you think he re- – I thought he did redeem himself when he risked his life for Sansa, where his idea of risking his life, he was like, I'll distract him, and ran, like, 15 yards <laughs> and, like, didn't do anything. It was, like, the worst. He was like, I'll head him off, you go. And then he, like, went, like, 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 ha- like a half a block away. And then I was like, yeah, she's right there. <laughs> like, like, they found her right away. It was so – it's it's just like so incredibly bizarre. Like at this point, I think he's irredeemable. I think he's irredeemable. Clem, is he irredeemable? You know what? Fuck it. I'm I'm, I'm riding for Theon here. What? You know what? I I might have done the same fucking thing. Man. What do you I mean? My sister. Yo, man. Every this show, we hate when Littlefinger pulls switcheroos on people and he backstabs people. Theon. He is who we thought he was. And you know what? He's staying that way. I got to give the guy credit. At least he's staying on character here. I don't agree with what he's done. I I probably, in all honesty, wouldn't have jumped off that boat. But you know what? We know who Theon is. And you got to give the guy credit. Snake it till you make it. (laughs) I think you would have jumped off that boat. I never, before the show, never would have thought you would have jumped off this boat. Like, if I were to pick one ride or die guy at Barstool, it probably would have been you. In fact, you even entertained it. 
you can't, Mike, you're not Team Theon, right? Dude, that's a battle axe, Charlie, a battle axe. We just said how badass they are. Are you going out to do with a battle axe? And you your sister's throw, it's over, man. What do you think it does with Yara? I mean, she's clearly not dead. We would have seen her die because they, the two people hanging in front of the ship are the Sand Snakes, I believe. I'm going to take a second look before I write the recap log. So do you think he's going to, she's going to be the gift along with Laria? Do you think he'll just like torture her and he, or do you think he'll just outright kill her? What do you think we see from her next? I feel like there's got to be some sort of torture in the future because uh, like a lot of the rumblings you've heard is that Euron's just going to cement himself as like a guy who's even more demented than Ramsey Bolton and takes all that up a notch. So the idea that he would torture and kill, uh, you know, who's essentially amounts to his niece, like that's not out of the realm of possibility for me. So I I feel like it's going to go that route to just really drive home that this guy is a full-blown sicko since he's going to be a power player here. Yeah, maybe it's probably no Game of Thrones, a certain word that starts with an R that I don't say out loud on things that are recorded. Clem, what do you uh, what do you think we see him do with Yara? I think Yara, she might just, I think uh, Ilaria Sand, that's going to be the gift. That's the Chekhov's gun coming home to roost. Chekhov's bang, bang, gun baby. is firing. <laughs> um, and I think he's just going to be like, and in case that's not enough proof for you that I got your back, here's my niece's head. I think he's just going to throw the head. And let me just kind of add this in. I hate like I I don't I'm I'm not a big guy who wants to, I don't need to see rape and pillaging I just need to see a little bit more from the Iron I need to see some savagery from the Iron Islanders I like I hear they're the baddest motherfuckers on the planet and they just rip people's eyeballs out like I saw a little bit of that on the boat like I want to see some badass dudes they took out that guy's teeth while he was still alive I mean that was pretty cool that was pretty cool but there was not the- ex- was not expecting that one just busting <laughs> out the knife I, I, I it's, oof that was cool. That was, cool. that was cool. I need to see a couple more of those if the Island Islanders are going to be in this for like the rest of the run here because like I need my like, you know, Ramsey was a motherfucker. Like this guy, if this guy's going to be better, there's, than, there's better a villain gap. Like the yeah. only obvious villain is Cersei. She's almost hard to root against because she's just given so much entertainment in the show. I mean, I'm rooting against her, but like for somebody who's just an obvious like psycho villain it was first joffrey then it was ramsey it's kind of euron and sort of like ramsey he did ha- he had he has a rock star air to him there's no doubt about it i mean he dressed like one euron euron's outfit like i tweeted at feidelberg like you just need to be wearing that to newport pretty soon like that like that that was something if i were cool which, I mean, people can see the haircut that I have on this YouTube show right now. Like, I'm not that cool. But, like, if I were cool, like, I would wear that all the time. Like, I think he has that rock star vibe, which Ramsey sort of had. Ramsey had that, like, I have I follow, like, more than one girl on Twitter who says, like, like I kind of find Ramsey sort of sexy. I know I shouldn't, but I do. So, like, I know, like, I, th- I feel like Euron's going to just be that guy. Euron kind of had some of that like Oberyn to him where it was super easy looking for him. It just, it got out there and everything came so natural. And you're right. He had a 2017 outfit on in Westeros. That thing plays then and it plays now. It definitely did. (laughs) And he's rocking, he's rocking the guy liner too, which you got to give it. If a guy's confident enough to rock the guy liner, like, you know, that's that's Captain Jack Sparrow. That made Disney like billions of dollars. So I fuck with Euron, man. I fuck with Euron. And in a weird, sick way, I kind of fuck with Theon still. Yeah, man. I mean, when I when I was abroad in London, hanging out with my English friends, like I was weird uh, that I wasn't wearing a guy guy liner. Like people were like looking, be like, "Who's this loser we let hang out with us who doesn't wear even eyeliner? Like, what an idiot!" All right, that's it for us. It's eleven oh eight. We'll let people go to sleep, or you know, people are watching tomorrow. We'll wrap it up now. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, probably the most high most well done, high budget, high production show that you've ever been on. So I'm sure this was a thrilling experience for you. So if you want to thank us right now, I'll give you that opportunity. Really appreciate it, guys. Nice to be able to come over here and talk about Harry Potter and Game of Thrones and swear on air. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. Any Anytime. Whenever you want to. You know, we're, we're here at the same time every week. Uh, Clone Will Tarly, White Bread Walker. Uh, any last words? I want to see a battle axe on that man's body soon. That's all I can think about right now. I want to see a battle well, axe. Get a Coming battle to a body axe. part near you. All right, but you have to like you have to hide a C for Clem and Char, or maybe like a little like P like post game of Thrones. Like I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all of Clem's uh, titles woven into the axe. <laughs> that would be that would be incredible. I think Clem. You know I what? Maybe we should get your all your titles tattooed like across. I know you don't have any tattoos like. If you got it from like fingertip to fingertip, like going dot dot dot, 
I was probably <laughs> oh let's grade the nickname. We should end every show with that grading the nickname. What do you guys think of that one of uh, the blogger without banners? I thought it was okay. I'll fuck with it. I'll give it a B. I'm gonna give it a B minus only because I do have a banner. I always rocked with Barstool New York. That was my banner. I guess now I don't have a banner anymore, actually. But right. um, I like it though. But you know, I can't be mean. I, I have to always give it at least a B minus. That's the worst I'm gonna give it. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so it was pretty bad. <laughs> to be honest, man, I would just I, every single every single one that we had, I noticed was about you being like a bigger guy. So I was trying to just go outside that because it just <laughs> started feeling like like mean so it's like that i was just trying to like kind of go outside that i appreciate it nonetheless <laughs> all right cool we're i'm glad we're still friends um all right thanks so much guys for coming thanks, on the mike. show we'll be here same time next week not mike but me and clem uh we'll be here same time uh next week uh, uh is it a longer episode next week though is it a 75 minute one is it one of the 75 minute ones i don't I know i haven't seen yet I hope okay so. yeah. <laughs> whatever 50 minutes after the episode ends uh barstool if you're watching this live barstool new york tomorrow there will be a uh blog that will go up sometime in the morning i realized it was late last time um i apologize for that it will be up in the a.m i will work on it as soon as we hang up right now uh i think that's the end of the show all right i'll see you guys later later guys